Welcome to the Cisco NetAcad CCNA Introduction to Networks video series by Jason Johnson. This video is Chapter 11, Build a Small Network, Part 1 of 2. In Part 2, the links will be in the description below. The material in this video covers the 6.0 version of the Cisco NetAcad CCNA Introduction to Networks course. Thank you for watching my videos. Your time is appreciated. And if you find the material helpful, you can subscribe to my channel. And remember to click the notification button if you want to see when I post new content. If you have any questions, or uh, if you have any questions, you can leave a comment below. And if you watch to the end of the video, I'll have links to the next chapter, which will be part two, and I'll also have a link back to uh, chapter ten. So let's take a look here at chapter eleven, part one of two. In part one, we're going to be looking at network design. Um, identifying the devices used in a small network, identify the protocols used in a small network, and explain how a network serves as the basis of larger networks. And then 11.2, we're going to look at network security. And then we'll have a part two, so uh, make sure that you uh, check the description below for the links to that or watch to the end of the video to be able to get the links to part two. Now with 11.1 network design, uh, small network topologies – um, when we de when we have devices in a small network, um, they comprise usually, and th this is this is just a general is generalization here. They usually have some type one type of router, maybe a couple of switches, and then the user PCs. In real small networks, you're not going to have the switches. Um, I know at my house we have a router. Uh, it's actually the modem and router um, when it comes in on the cable modem. Uh, it's a cable slash router, and then I have two other routers in the house because I want to segment out my uh, networks. One goes to uh, – my son does his uh, gaming on his Xbox, and then I have uh, another one set up for regular um, regular network and then Wi-Fi. And then I also segment out the Wi-Fi so that um, I have guest Wi-Fi, I have regular Wi-Fi, and it's segmented out as well. So you can do different things like that. Um, you can have you can have multiple routers. Uh, usually, you're only going to see maybe one or two routers in a small network, depending on the size of it. Uh, you might see a switch if you're going to run from um, and when we're talking about a small office or a, a small network, and you might be running to two different rooms or two different uh, areas of a building. You might put a switch in to be able to segment those uh, local area networks off, uh, but where you wouldn't necessarily need a router. So also small network topologies, access to the Internet through, usually through a single WAN link, a cable, or a DSL. Uh, management is usually by a third party. Uh, small companies, small businesses usually hire some contractor, um, which is probably what you may be training to do. Uh, you may be working for a company that hires yourself out. You may do, be doing contracting work yourself. I've done some contracting myself where I'll go out and help small companies out. Uh, they do not have the money to be able to go out and hire a full-time IT person. Nor should they because it's not a it's not cost effective uh, because they may only need IT support maybe one or two hours three hours a week uh, on a regular basis and for setup they may only need that person to come in you know maybe one or two weeks I've helped set up a small company and I worked for them for about six months uh, getting everything set up the server making sure the server is connected to the databases you know working with the database person and then they didn't need a full time IT person after that they needed some training and some things like that but they only needed the initial setup. And then they needed somebody to contract with them uh, from time to time to be able to work on computers and things like that. So it's usually by a third-party uh, company or a, a contractor. Now, the device selection for a small network, um, you're going to be looking at some different issues. You want security. You want quality of service. Uh, if you're going to do voice over IP, that's going to dictate the type of equipment that you're going to do. Do you need to do network address translation, and do you need to have and do you have to have DHCP services set up? So those are some those are some things that you might have on a small network. Now, on a small network with IP addressing, address space is a crucial component of a network design. Um, all devices connected to a network requ do require an address. However, they don't have to have an internet-enabled IP address when we're talking about the V4. Uh, you can use uh, a net network address translation to do the V4. But the address scheme must be planned out, documented, and maintained. And documented is the big one right here. You want you when you plan something out, that's fine. But you want to document, document, document. You want to have documents down, especially if you are a third party person coming in and doing that documentation. You want to have everything written down because you may not be the follow up person to 
that um, to, to, to come in and work on that network and somebody that comes in behind you, uh, and I've done it before, where you come in and you're like, well, where does this wire go? And why is this switch was put here? You know, why was this switch put here? And why, why, do, why are they using this IP addressing scheme? And so if you document that, you can put your thoughts to paper. It may just be a Google Doc. I mean, it may just be an electronic document that you uh, put on there, but it needs to be documented. Address space uh, documentation can be um, very useful for troubleshooting and control. And the reason you document, especially on a small network, I mean, you need to do it for large networks too, but especially for a small network, just like I said, you may not be the person that tries to come in and fix it down the road. It may be somebody else, or you may be coming in behind somebody else trying to fix it, and you would really appreciate some documentation there. So address documentation is also important when controlling resource access. So you want to be able to know who's got access, you know, who's in what land areas and things like that. So, um, Redundancy in a small network, you probably can't put a whole bunch of a redundancy depending upon cost because usually small networks are limited on – when we talk about resources, they're limited in their money that they're able to spend. So a network should be reliable by design. However, the more reliable you make it, the more expensive it gets. So there is a trade-off there. So uh, what you have to do is when you are working with a company, you have to understand that cost trade-off and what is the return on investment for extra equi extra equipment. For example, let's, let's look at this uh, redundancy over here. Let's say that a, uh, a company says, oh, we don't need that extra router and switch. We, we don't need this over here. But let's say that this switch goes down and they're down. That company can't operate. They cannot get out to the internet, but if they have two, if they have two routers and two switches, and let's say this one goes down, then this one can still, uh, you can reroute, or let's just say that, um, you know, this server goes down, it can still reroute to this switch and go this way. It doesn't have to go, um, it can still come through here. It, you know, it that you've got redundancy built in, and let's say that you build redundancy in maybe even between your routers, so you're going to have redundancy built in there, and there's a cost to it, and you just have to work that out with the company to be able to say. Network failures are costly. Uh, I've worked for a company that was a penny-pinching company, and they just did not want to spend money. I had a server that went down all the time. And so what I had to do is document the downtime, and I did it over a three-month period. And then I showed them, here's how much it's costing you in downtime. And if you would just go spend an extra $5,000, let's just get $5,000, put in a new server, and here's what your uptime is going to be over the next year. And here's and it's it's going to you're going to save that money over the next just in one year. They saved money on their return on investment just by spending that five thousand dollars because of downtime on the old server. They had people just sitting there not working, uh, you know, large amounts of time. Uh, and and it was just very easy to be able to say, here's your downtime, here's what it's costing you, here's your per hour cost of not being able to work, and here's what you're going to spend on a new new equipment, and here's what the payback's going to be. So you just have to make that sell. You have to be kind of a sales person when you do that you have to uh, make it logical and say here you know here here's what you're getting back for your money so redundancy increases reliability by eliminating single points of failure so that's basically when we're talking about redundancy in networks that's what we're talking about redundancy can be achieved by duplicating a network equipment and links however that's costly so that you have a trade off there and a good example is a network's link to the internet or to a server farm um, a lot of companies only have one link out to the internet uh, the company that I was consulting for that I said that I worked for about six months doing that, we had backup internet. Um, even though it was costly for them, we had a regular DSL line, and this was this was about 10 years ago. It, it's been a while, uh, but actually it's been more than 10 years. Wow. Okay, so um, we had we had a regular DSL coming in, and then we also set up a wireless connection. Uh, there was a company in that town that had point-to-point uh, -point wireless where we could uh, put up an antenna on our building, and we had that as a backup. So that if our main DSL line went down, which it could tend to happen every now and then, they could still send orders through because they were very time sensitive. Uh, they were um well, I don't want to say what they what exactly they did because it gives away of what company I worked for, but they the, the the type of work that they did was very time sensitive. When they would get when they would have orders placed with them, they had a, a small amount of window of time to be able to get those orders turned back around and back out the door. And so they could not be down. They just could not afford to be down. They lost too much money. So they spent the extra money. Uh, well, one we had two DSL lines coming in, so we had duplicate. But when DSL went down, both of them went down. And then so we put the backup of point to point Wi-Fi or point point to point wireless in. Now, with traffic management, traffic type and patterns are also should also be considered when designing a network. 
uh, in traffic patterns. And what I mean by that is uh, bandwidth and how much data is going to be going through. If you have a uh, database um, traffic going through, that's going to be heavier than maybe somebody that's just um, going out to a web portal and putting in orders to for a company. And so a good network design categorizes traffic according to the priority. And by that, we mean what, what has the most priority? Well, voice is going to have the highest priority but, you know, if you're doing voice over IP because it has to get through. Your, fo your phones have to be up and running, where FTP has a lower priority because sending files – you know, and it, it if you if you you know watch the other chapters, you know we learned about TCP protocols and reliability and connection oriented, and that's you know FTP would make sure that those files go through. Well, they they have um, that those files are going to be be ensured that they go through, but it's a lower priority because they can get resent back and forth. So if they can't upload the file at that at that particular minute, it can uh, it can queue it up and send it on back through. So you have higher priority, and then you have lower priority based on services. Now, common applications in a small network, uh, those are usually uh, network applications used to communicate over the network. Uh, you might have a DNS server maybe on a small network. I usually – usually you don't have a DNS server on a, on a small network, but you could set one up. You might have a telnet server. Uh, you might or might not have an email server depending upon the size of the company. Uh, you most likely are going to have a DHCP server set up to be able to pass out IP addresses. You may or may not have a web server. Again, depending on the size of the company and the focus, they may choose to put that out on the cloud, and they may have an FTP server, and that might be where clients could drop files off and things like that. Uh, email clients, web browsers are examples of the types of applications. Uh, application layer services, programs that interface with the network and prepare the data for transfer, and then each service uses protocols which define the standards and data uh, formats to be used. So that's the application layer services there. Now, common protocol uh, processes on either end uh, on either end of the communication session, um, or pro excuse me, let me re let me re-say that processes on either end of the communication session session, uh, how messages are sent and the expected response time is set, uh, types in the syntax of messages, the meaning of the informational fields, your packets that are going through, and then interaction with the next lower layer. layer. That's what the common protocols do for you, and we learned about that in earlier chapters. This is just a follow-up to that. Now, on voice and video applications, you have your infrastructure that needs to be set up. You might be using voice over IP, uh, IP telephony. Uh, you might also have real-time applications that might you might be doing video chat. And those are the real-time applications that you might have on a small network as well. Now, small network growth, uh, one of the things is for certain is you're probably going to grow a small network at some point. So we call that scaling, or you'll hear the term scalability. So how, how um, easy is a network to scale, or what is the scalability of a network? So you have to, one, first document your network to make sure that you can see where everything is, and then you can plan for some scalability. Now, how do you do that? Well, that's where you get with the business side, and you say, what are your business plans six months down the road, You know, 12 months, 18 months down the road, 24 months down the road? And you put those – and you ask those types of questions of, are you planning to add another – You know, how many, how many people are you planning to add to your network over the next you know, six months to a year? And then you can plan for that. You know, uh, device inventory. Make sure that you have a good device inventory so that you can say, okay, here's where we need to grow. If we need to add uh, more endpoints, you know, if if we are if we have a 24 port switch in place, and I have 20 end computers connected to that, and the company says, well, we know we're going to grow by 10 over the next year. Well, you know, you're going to need another switch. Because that 24 ports, you've only got four more ports on that, and so you're going to need another switch in place. So that's that's what we're talking about, making sure that you can scale that. Uh, budget comes into play, and then traffic analysis also comes into play. Because let's say that you have, uh, let's say that you have a switch in place here, and we have this switch here, and you're sending all your traffic to that switch, and it's getting bogged down. Uh, you're just, you're just getting all, you know, it's just it. Your bandwidth is just not being able to handle it. You might put another switch in place, and let's say that you segment off your engineers. And I'm just using an example. You have an engineering department, uh, you know, two or three engineers, and they are sending large files out to the cloud because they are updating engineering files. And, you know, maybe they're doing CAD drawings or something like that, and they're sending those large files out to the cloud. Well, you might put them on a separate switch uh, so that their uh, bandwidth isn't taking up uh, as much um, uh, of, of the uh, traffic. As maybe the rest of the com rest of the company, so that's just that's just one example of how you might uh, analyze traffic. Now, with protocol analysis, you need to understand the protocols in use in the network. 
uh, protocol analyzers or tools uh, designed to help in that task. Um, I really have not used a protocol analyzer at a small network. So you're usually going to see those on larger, larger networks, but those are available. They capture traffic in high utilization times and in different locations of the network so that you can kind of do a problem solving of, okay, when's our high traffic point and why is it at this point? You know, is it, is it two to three o'clock in the afternoon, two to four o'clock in the afternoon? Or let's say that it's from three to four o'clock in the afternoon. And why is it so, why is it so um, high during that time? Well, that's the time. Let's go back up to our, to our example of the engineers. At three o'clock in the afternoon, there's a deadline for those engineers to get their files up to the company. Uh, or up to the uh, the salespeople. And so at three o'clock, they start uploading. And so you're going to see a huge spike at three o'clock. And so that might be a business decision to be able to say, hey, could we get with the engineering department and can we load them earlier or can we do something different because we're having high traffic utilization during that time? So analysis results allow for a more efficient way to manage traffic. Now, employee network utilization, be aware of how the network use is changing uh, based upon users. And I just gave an example of uh, you know, time of day. And that's not always something that's that's uh, that's going to be known. You have to talk to the business side uh, to, to figure that out because you may be sitting there going, man, I don't understand why at three o'clock every day there's traffic. Well, that's if you go talk to the business people and you go talk to your customers and say, OK, we're getting high traffic at three o'clock. What's going on? You know, what are you what are you doing in your day to day work that that's causing that? And then you can find that information out. So a network administrator can create in-person IT snapshots of employee application utilization, you know, by person. And you could say, OK, this endpoint is sending up this amount. Uh, this endpoint is sending up this amount. And then you can find that. And I, I have had um, an example of where we had a user that was uh, doing a side business uh, using the network uh, in the company. And so we did some network utilization tools and we figured out that there was a large amount of traffic going to a particular endpoint. And we went and looked at files and things like that. And we were like, you know, they shouldn't have this much network traffic. And we found out that they were storing personal business um, off business. It had nothing related to our business. Uh, they were doing work outside the company, but they were using our company's network and storage to put their files on there. So we use the network analysis to be able to figure that out. All right, well, let's switch over to 11.2 network security. So when you get into security, you have to um, you have to uh, figure out what are your types of threats to a company. And, and let me say, I also teach security courses um, for the community college I work for and from other places. And what I will tell you is no network is 100% secure. It, and, and anybody in the security security side is going to tell you that you, you're never going to get 100% secure. What you have to do is it's it's a comprehensive, it's a ongoing comprehensive task that you have to be doing with the security side. It's really never ending. So what you have to start with is figure out your types of threats. Uh, digital intrusion can be costly, but is it always coming from intrusion? Could it be from the inside? Could you know? I just gave an example of an employee that was doing something internally uh, that was uh, not necessarily a, a security threat, but it was uh, it was impacting the, the business. So intruders can gain access to software through vulnerabilities, hardware attacks, and stolen credentials. Uh, common types of digital threats include those listed in the graphic over here. Uh, you, and no, those are physical over there. The graphics not okay, so not listed in the graphic over there. Um, you can you, you can come in through uh, digital attacks. I'll just I'll just list off a few here. Uh, but digital threats can come in through uh, malware that may come into your company. You might get uh, you know emails that come in that say, hey, you know you need you need to up, update your password. You know, click here to do that. And so it's it's about training and it's about layering your security. So when we talk about physical security, though, it's not always just digital security. It's also physical security. Is your hardware physically secured? Is it behind, you know, it, are your servers behind, you know, we have our servers here. Are they behind a locked door or can just anybody get in? Do, we ha do you have a card reader in place? Uh, you, do you? Do you have somebody close to the door that can see people coming in and out? Um, at a com another company I worked for, uh, the door to the IT room had a card reader on it, but we also had the main receptionist person up front uh, where the IT door was. So if anybody tried to go in that IT door, that person could see them. And so we knew that even if you had a key card, you still had to get past the receptionist, and they knew who was supposed to be up in that IT area. So we had layers of security. 
You have environmental environmental security. You know, is your AC back? You know, do you have enough AC? Is your AC in a backup situation? So, if your you know what main AC goes down, do you have a backup for it? You know, that those are things you need to think about too. Electrical and maintenance. So, you know, what's your backup plan for when you lose electricity, and maintaining uh, maintaining uh, your system as well. So, when we talk about types of vulnerabilities, uh, there's three primary vulner- vulnerabilities. You have technological configuration and secu- your security policy. And let's talk about technological first. So your technological is what type of technology are you using? Uh, do you have the right amount of you do have the right equipment? Do you have do you have the software? Uh, is it configured properly? That's the second part. Do you have everything pro- properly set up? Or do your router are your routers properly configured securely? Uh, you know, do you have passwords? Did you encrypt your passwords? Did you put banners and message of the days on there? And then do you have a comprehensive security policy in place? And that is the policy of where it goes down through, and, I, and I'm not that the lecture on this goes beyond the scope of this presentation. But when you put a security policy, and you can find all of all kinds of them out on the internet, uh, but when you put a security policy in place, it needs to be comprehensive, it needs to be updated, and it needs to be reviewed regu- regularly. And what I mean by regularly, it may be every six months that you pull. You know, do you have a Maybe not just IT people. Um, I, I've been involved where we have we have the IT people, we have the maintenance people, we have the facilities people. You might have the HR people involved, human resources, because all of those different areas. You pull a team of people together to review that security policy in a broader scope of the security of the company. Okay, so endpoints. We're going to switch gear to endpoints here. Uh, they can be under attack as well, such as servers and desktop computers. Somebody walking into the facility. Any of those three vulnerabilities can be exploited and used in an attack, so you just have to be watching for all of those different areas. So you have different types of malware uh, you know, can come in, and in this, this presentation is not going to cover all security threats. So you're maybe saying to yourself, well, he didn't cover this in there. Well, you know, right, this is not going to cover everything. This is not a security class. This is just an overview of security for the routing and switching introduction of networks. But some of the types of malware, you know, you might have a virus or a worm or a Trojan horse that comes in. Um, it may not be somebody from the outside trying to get in. It may be an employee over here. You may have this employee over here setting at their computer, and they opened up a file they weren't supposed to. They brought in a USB drive from home that they had downloaded this. Maybe they have – I'll give you an example. This was years and years ago. We had removed – and this was back with Windows 4.1. Uh, this will tell you, That tells you how long, it, uh, how long ago it was. Um, and we had some users that were playing Solitaire, so the management decided, hey, we want to remove Solitaire off the computers. Well, some um, enterprising employees figured out how to put um, – how to put solitaire on a floppy disk, put it back in the computer, and play on their break or play when nobody was around. Uh, and the, all, the way we found that out was we went to boot a computer and it wouldn't boot up properly because that person had left the uh, floppy drive in. And so it wouldn't boot properly because it was trying to boot to the A drive, which was the floppy drive. And so that was an internal threat. I mean it, it's, a, it's an old example, but it's an internal threat of it. Uh, you can have reconnaissance attacks. Uh, those are uh, users from the outside that try to ping your network. They try to get into the router. Uh, they try to discover and map your systems and services to figure out what's there, to figure out what vulnerability you have. They try to acquire enough information to target the system or network to facilitate the search for vulnerabilities. So they try to break in so that they can search. It's really a probing attack. Um, and good hackers, um, the good ones, and I don't mean they're good people. I just mean the ones that know what they're doing as far as from from a – uh, from a illegal standpoint, uh, they will leave as small a footprint as possible. Uh, they won't necessarily try to break in and do anything wrong at first. They're probing for vulnerabilities because they're trying to discover how deep they can get into the network. How much information can they get access to? What is available to them? So they're going to keep acquiring information until they get full access, and then they can then pull information out or maybe saying, okay, well, I've got this information over here, but wait a minute. There might be something even better. I might be able to get all kinds of uh, personal information, credit card information, you know, database information. So they keep, they keep probing. So um, some common tools that they rely on uh, usually are free or public internet services such as DNS, who is. I mean you would be, you would be amazed at um, – and, and I've done it with my – when I teach security classes – uh, we set and we do DNS searches or we do a who is and we say, OK, who's the administrator on this account? And we find out that it's John Smith. And so it's a small company and we call up and we say, hey, this is I'm, I'm working with John Smith to uh, update your website. I just need to get this information from you. Can you tell me your IP address? And they walk you through and get the IP address from you. 
the internal IP address. So you're trying to ping in, and now if I've got the internal IP address and I've got the external IP address on the router, I can start doing some things where I can try to break through the router at that point. Um, so you know, just things like that, looking up a company to see you know who works there and get the IT information or get the CIO information, things like that. Um, you know, just searching to see are documents available through the through the public network. Uh, I've done that before with my security classes, where we just we scan a company or we scan you know a place and we say, do they have any documents or Excel doc? Do they have any Excel documents open? And I've seen it before, where uh, a company just had an Excel document with all kinds of employees' information, and it was available on the internet. I mean, it was available to the it was forward facing to the internet. You could you could see that Excel document on the internet. And if you just – it wasn't on a web page or anything like that, but if you just search their network, it, somebody had left it on a web server, and you could get pull that Excel file up. They had shared it with somebody else at some point, and they had just left it there, and so it was exposed. All right. Also, you use port scanners and packet sniffers. Those are commonly used in reconnaissance, so you might tie into a Wi-Fi, especially like a public Wi-Fi, and you start packet sniffing, or they find physical access to a network jack. Uh, that's in your building, and they plug it. They they they've got access to that, and they plug in a jack, and they can sit there and start wire sniffing. It's just um, that that's what that's why physical security is even so important. You have um, access attacks. Uh, those are password attacks, trust exploitation, port redirection, man in the middle attacks, where they try to uh, say that you know make you think that there's somebody else. So like if uh, a victim here is thinks they're going to a website, but they're actually going through this web server first, and then it's going down here and they're parsing all that information and reading it. So it's unencrypting it here. May even if it's encrypted, they're unencrypting it here, reading it and then forwarding it to the server and then back. So this person thinks they're on the server, but they're not. Somebody's reading it. Denial of service attacks are also a very real thing. A DOS, or you'll hear the term DOS. Uh, a simple DOS attack, or you would think that they're simple, but they're still dangerous. That's where a um, an attacker will have all kinds of a botnet, maybe, uh, or a directed uh, what they call a directed denial of service. And what they'll do is they'll have their bot system start flooding that web server, for an example. Let's just say we're, we're not going to say we have a man in the middle here. This person here – actually, I'll tell you what. This person here sends information to all these bots and says, okay, start pinging this web server. And so they might have 5,000 different endpoints, victims, start pinging this web server. Well, if you get start hitting that, depending upon what uh, level of um, – traffic you're paying for, you may shut that web server down and you may not be able to get to it. Now, they didn't actually hack the web server, but what they've done is they've, they've effectively shut the road down to that web server, so they've shut your business down. So preventing denial of service attacks by applying, applying the latest security updates. There's also services it, services that you can employ uh, to, to, to fix that, um, but some common uh, DOS attacks are ping of death, the send flood, directed denial of service, maybe a smurf attack. Uh, there's different ways, and there are uh, solutions to all of those. Um, not always right away, but they're, they're usually you can fix those solutions and their services that will help you with that. So how do we mitigate network attacks? You back up. You make sure that you're upgrading your equipment to the newest that, that's, that's secure. Make sure that you're always update and make sure that you're patched. A lot of times – a company gets hacked because there's some kind of vulnerability out there, and they didn't patch the system. So you want to keep up to date with the latest developments. Your enterprises need to keep current with the latest versions of antivirus software. Uh, patch for all known vulnerabilities. They must be applied. And a central patch server is good for managing large numbers of servers, and patches should be installed without user intervention. In other words, updates need to go out to the endpoints without the users overriding them and stopping them. So – Authentication, authorization, and accounting. So AAA here. Those are services provide access control on a network device. You want to authenticate so that you know uh, access to a resource is authenticated. Authorized, what can that person do? You know who the person is. What can, once that person is known, what can that person do or what we call a need-to-know basis? And then accounting, tracking, actions performed while accessing the resource. How, you know, what did that per so we know who the person is. We know who the person is. We know what they have access to, and we know where they're going. So I call it www authentication. Who you know who? What do they have access to, and where are they going? And then the AAA framework can be helpful in mitigating network attacks and setting up your security policy. Firewalls are another way um, to secure, and you're going to be working with firewall systems in this uh, in this course and future uh, Cisco courses. Uh, but the firewall controls the traffic and helps helps prevent unauthorized access. It doesn't stop on 100%, but it helps. Um, it does help prevent. 
techniques for determining what is permitted or denied. Uh, you might packet filter. You might application filter. You might filter by URL. And you might do a stateful packet inspection, and you're going to learn about that later on in, in, in other classes, uh, but where you do a stateful packet inspection or just packet filtering, and you're saying only certain types of packets come in. Uh, only, only packets get returned that we know verified that come from internal to begin with. So if it goes out of the server, uh, you know, if it comes back in, it's got to have originated from inside the, from inside the system, inside the LAN the, uh, on that. You also have endpoint security. Uh, those um, common endpoints are laptops, desktops, servers, smartphones, tablets. All of those are a risk. So securing endpoint devices is, uh, is challenging, especially when you have your bring your own devices where you allow your employees or other people to bring devices and put them on the network. That's also challenging. Employees need to be trained on proper use of the network. Training, training, training. I can't tell you how – I mean it's just you, you want to train. Uh, I, I And I'll give you a quick example here. I had a, a – a manager, and I'm going to reiterate that, it was a manager. Um, we had trained our employees not to open emails if they didn't know who they were from. Manager calls me up, says, I got this email from a sales rep, but I don't know I don't know what it is. It's got an attachment to it. And I said, well, don't open it. I'll be down in about 15 minutes or so. I'm working on a project, but just don't open it. We'll take a look at it in a few minutes. I get down to the desk, ask the manager, hey, you know, what about that? And uh, and the person said, oh, I opened that up and it was nothing. They they go, they go it was it was something, you know, that, that they had sent me. I think, in fact, I think it was like a... It was like a music file or some stupid something like that. It wasn't. It wasn't anything business related. It was just something funny that the person sent. But I just had to do a face palm because it was like. It was like. Did I not train you? You're supposed to be the manager here. And did I not tell you don't open stuff unless we take a look at it first, unless we scan it first? And you know this was a few years ago before things got automatically scanned. And it was just a point of you know training just failed in that point. And and they were like, oh no, well it's fine because nothing happened. Well yeah, that case. But it could have happened, and that was the point I was trying to get across. It could have happened. So policies often include the use of antivirus software, intrusion prevention, uh, and comprehensive endpoint security solutions rely on network access control, uh, you know, logins, you know, who's in, checking your security logs, things like that. Data security overview, or I'm sorry, device security overview. Default settings are dangerous because they're well known. Uh, Cisco routers have the Cisco auto secure feature. You want to make sure that you always change passwords, that you update passwords, that you encrypt passwords, things like that. So you want to change default usernames and passwords immediately upon, before you put before you put the device on the network or what I call into production. You want to make sure that you do all these things first. Don't put it out there and then start changing it. Get it updated, get it working, and then put it into the system. You want to restrict access to the system's resources to authorized individuals only. Turn off unnecessary services. If you're not using FTP services, turn them off. There's no reason for those ports to be open if you're not using FTP services. Update any software and install security patches prior to production operation. Prior to production operation. You always want to get everything up and running, and that's why I've had that had that question before. Uh, that I, as I told you earlier with the company that I worked for for about six months, uh, it, it took me a couple of weeks to get the one server up and running, and I kept – you know, a, a couple of people were like, well, how come it's taking so long? And I'm like, because I want to make sure everything is working right on this and secure before we put it in place. They had never had that concept before. The previous IT person just didn't do that. They just threw things into production and had no thought for security whatsoever. And then when they had somebody come along that it was actually applying uh, the policies and things like that, they couldn't understand why it was taking extra time. And I'm just, you know, having to tell them if you want it done right, it's going to take a little bit extra time. You know, if you want it done the proper way. Make sure that you have good password policies in place. Um, you know, use strong passwords and four strong passwords. Make sure it's at least eight characters. I always go with 12. It says preferably 10 or more. I always go with 12 or more. You want to make sure that you have a mix of uppercase and lowercase numbers, symbols, and spaces. I don't really go with spaces because that can really mess you up sometimes. Uh, but lowercase numbers and symbols. No repetition, no common dictionary words except for um, – I would I will go I will tell you I'm I'm in the camp from the security side where you could use let's say that you have five different words that you put together uh, and you put you know horse and I'm not going to spell it out but you know horse uh, eats uh, or let's just say you do horse horse boat duck buggy horse duck horse horse duck boat buggy and you can spell that out and that's that's a fairly good password because it's long and if you put uppercase and lowercase in there uh, it's going to take a little bit of time for a password cracker to get that um, but you want to do uh, no usernames um, 
uh, should be be using a relative or pet names, no other easily identified pieces of information. Uh, just recently, Equifax, if you if you go back and search the news, if you're watching this video later on, but this is in September of 2017, Equifax, the credit reporting company, was hacked. And in that hack process, it came out that the CIO and some of the top people in the company were using just common names. They were using pet names or relative names, birth dates, things like that. The, the, the top people that are supposed to be the most aware, the CIO, the chief information officer, was using insecure passwords. Uh, it, it's just, uh, it, you know, it's inconceivable that that's happening in today, you know, in 2017, but it still is. Misspelled words were, or can still be cracked because data dictionary, rainbow dictionaries, uh, cracking dictionaries, put misspelled words, common misspelled words on there, and you want to make sure that you change them often. Now, there's a lot of debate on how often should you change it. Should it be 90 days? Should it be 30? Should it be 60? That's uh, that's really where you need to come up with your security policy and come up with a, a plan on that and, and and research what common is and you know how often do you think you need to change it, things like that. On Cisco routers, they do support the use of pa phrase, use of a phrase made of many words. Like I just said, you know, horse, horse, duck, buggy, boat uh, would be an example of that, and that's what's called a passphrase, and and it, it is supported in there. However, I would say you would still probably want to put a um, uh, some uppercase and lowercase in there, and maybe do some what I call haystacking, where maybe you put some symbols on the front and the back, maybe you put five stars on the front and five hashtags on the end end point, so you kind of uh, make it longer and you do what they call haystacking with the password. Now, some basic security practices. Strong passwords are only as useful as they are secret. So if you lose your password, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's 20 characters long. It doesn't matter if it's 100 characters long. My, my Google password is over 100 characters long. I think it's 102 characters long. Uppercase, lowercase, number symbols. I don't remember. I use a password manager to do that. If I lost that password, it's no longer secure except for the fact that I use two-factor authentication. You have to have a USB key to log into unknown devices on my Gmail account. So, you know, you, you put those things in place. Now, on the um, Cisco side, the service password encryption command encrypts the passwords and configuration. Always do that. Always do it. The security passwords minimum length, always do that. That ensures all configured passwords have a minimum specified length. You can force password links. Do that. Blocking several consecutive login attempts helps minimize password brute force attacks. You want to do that. And then you want to log in blocks for 120 attempts, attempts three within 60. That will block login attempts for 120 seconds if there are three failed login attempts within 60 seconds. Now, you may say to yourself, why would you do that? Well, that's the way if you've got somebody that's just constantly pinging the uh, the device trying to get in, if it gets it wrong three times within 60 seconds, it locks it down for 120 seconds, and then it makes it that much longer for them to keep trying to put passwords in because then it's going to have to wait 120, sec 120 seconds before it can try again. And if it tries wrong again, then it's do it again. And that's where my password manager that I use does that. So if somebody was trying to crack my password using a dictionary attack, or something along those lines, um, it, after so many failed attempts, it will lock it down for a certain amount of time. And it gets increasingly, the one I use, gets increasingly longer. So it does. It may do it for 100, you know, it may do it for 60 seconds the first time, then 120 the next time, and then maybe three, you know, 300 the next time. So, um, but with your Cisco devices, you want to put that in place. And then you also want to do the exec timeout that automatically disconnects idle users on a line. Always make sure you have that in place as well. All right, you want to make sure that you enable SSH. Telnet is not secure, is not secure. So enable SSH. It's highly recommended to use SSH for all remote shell protocols. Just do it. When it says highly recommended, just do it. Don't, don't, don't use Telnet. To configure a Cisco device to support SSH, you need to take these four steps. You need to ensure the router has a unique host name and an IP domain name. You need to generate the SSH keys. You need to generate a local username, and then you need to enable VTY inbound SSH sessions. Sessions, And the router can then now be remotely accessed only by using SSH. Only by SSH. No, te no, no Telnet. Just don't use Telnet. It's not good. You'll have a bad day. All right. So this has been Chapter 11, Part 1. I know it's a little bit longer, and do I have that. I have Chapter Summary Part 2 on there. Uh, this is Part 1. We looked at how to, how small networks can scale into a larger network, and we also looked at how configuring switches and routers and device hardening features to enhance security, and we looked at uh, security kind of in a general phase. So this has been a little bit longer video in this series, and I apologize for that for the length, uh, but there's just so much material here in Chapter 11, and we have a second part.
part two. So if you hold on for a few seconds, uh, you'll see the links to that or check in the description below. And I hope this video was helpful for you, and I hope you have a great day.